here and also the Associate Dean, Research and Graduate Studies for the Faculty of Law. Um, I'm also the founding director of the Law Disability and Social Change Project, which I run here with a group of students. Um, I'm delighted to provide some opening remarks today for this event, which, is, uh, which has been organized by myself and Dr. Jujian Baranka from the Disability Studies Program um, of the School of Social Work. So let me start with a land acknowledgement to recognize that our event today takes place on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy, comprised of the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. We're grateful to be here. Today's event is sponsored by the Law, Disability, and Social Change Project and the Disability Studies Program of the School of Social Work. And just a couple of logistical points. Um, we have live remote captioning taking place. Um, and we thank the Office of Human Rights, uh, put, uh, sorry, Equity and Accessibility for supporting um, this. Uh, the captioning is on both screens. The event is also being recorded, and the captioned recording will be available on the Law, Disability, and Social Change Project website shortly. So it's a true honor for me to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Dr. Jay Dalmich is an Associate Professor of English at the University of Waterloo. Um, when asked to provide a brief biography, Professor Dalmage indicated a number of characteristics that are deeply ingrained in his work and way of living. He is committed to disability rights in his scholarship, service, and teaching. His work brings together rhetoric, writing, disability studies, and critical pedagogy. His first book, titled Disability Rhetoric, was published with Syracuse University Press in 2014. In 2017, Academic Ableism, Disability in Higher Education was published with Michigan University Press and is available in an open access version online. Most recently, his book, Disabled Upon Arrival, Eugenics, Immigration, and the Construction of Race and Disability, um, was published in 2018 with Ohio State University Press. He's the founding editor of the Canadian Journal of Disability Studies. He's also a graduate of the University of Windsor, where he completed his MA in English. But what he provided is quite modest. Um, I've learned this from reading his work, which I often include in my syllabi for courses, um, and also from interactions with him and preparing for today. I think most would agree that Professor Dalmage is one of the leading thinkers in the area of academic ableism, among other topics relating to ableism generally. His lecture today is on an extremely topical and timely subject, and it's with great pleasure then that I welcome Professor Dalmage to Windsor Law and turn over the mic to him to present his lecture this afternoon called Academic Ableism, Disability, and Higher Education. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you all for coming as well. Um, there's lots of food here. I just want to encourage people to use the space the way that they need to. That includes coming and getting coffee or food. Um, well, however you need to move around and use the space, please do. Um, I need to be hinged sort of up here to, to the laptop for captioning, um, but uh, I hope, I am, I'm also hoping to have lots of time for questions. One thing I'll point out, there are the large print copies. Um, there's also a website, and it is Access Windsor, all one word, so accesswindsor.wordpress.com. All of my materials are there and a bunch of links um, that we may or may not get to talking about. Um, but hopefully, uh, because uh, of the nature of the time we have together, um, there may be other things that you want to explore or things that I said that you want to double check or references to other more important, interesting things that I brought up, um, then you can go to the website and do that. And I hope you also share that. So if there are things that you found useful or valuable or people that you know who, who can't be here because it's such a busy time, um, please do share that link. I'll leave it up. Um, and you can access those materials. Um, I'm going to ask if we can hand out note cards here. There are three colors of note card, okay? So they have two purposes. Um, one is you can ask questions on them, anonymous questions. Those are often the best questions, all right? And in an environment like this, people don't always want to put their hand up. So I do hope I get some questions, because often the ones on the note cards are the best ones. The other thing is that there are red, green, and yellow cards. Um, the red you can hold up if I'm either speaking too quickly, right, or if there's a concept that you'd like to have unpacked. I try to do that as much as I can, but sometimes I don't, right? So if there's something you want further explanation of, you can do that. The green, you could hold up if you want to, and it just says, I'm doing a good job. <laughs> and the yellow would be a version of that, which is maybe slow down a little bit. Okay, so the 
no farts are coming around. I will say I'm kind of a read from the pager. Uh, I need to do that to stay on track and keep my thoughts organized. Um, so that, that will be the modality of a, a fair amount of this. But I hope that, um, you know what I'm going to say, also you have the, the copies of the PowerPoint slides. Those slides show especially three images that I want to use as metaphors, right? In a way that the, those images are a map for the talk and they organize it, but they also give us a way to think through an image about something that's, I think, much larger and more pervasive. Um, those PowerPoint slides are also available through the website if you want to pull them up on your, on your um, device or, or computer. Okay. So I'm also going to provide a thick description of the images, so even if you don't want to look at them, hopefully I can evoke them. And the other thing I think is that I'm trying to choose images that you all will recognize, right? The first one is an image of the steps in Dillon Hall, right? If I remember correctly, they're the stairs when you come into the kind of inner sanctum of Dillon Hall, there's a stairway that kind of comes up through the middle, and it's like a, 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 there's a kind of circular pathway. It's very gothic railings, and the, um, the, the kind of mezzanine itself is surrounded by uh, gothic wrought iron railings. There are kind of these curved cornices on, on all of the doors, right? It's a very gothic piece of architecture. The stairs are also very old, right? They're worn stairs, and they're very steep stairs. So that's the first image that I want to leave with you today, right? I think um, that image of the steep steps is something I'm going to keep coming back to. The other image is of a retrofit, okay? So Windsor is engaged in, like many Ontario universities, retrofitting some older buildings um, to provide access. There's an architectural firm called DeMeo Designs um, that's doing much of this retrofitting. On their website, you can see images that model what some of these projects will look like. For instance, I think we could probably agree Essex Hall, it's not in very good shape, right? Do people agree with that? All right. Uh, proposed revitalization would, off, would involve adding, actually, a flight of stairs and then laying out an elaborate switchback ramp to the far left of the building. So in the image of this ramp, we see the front of the hall, we see that large set of stairs, and then we see the ramp to the far left. Um, there's another image of this, of this um, ramp. It's an overhead view. It shows how the ramp runs about 20 feet to the left of the image and then switches back for another 20 feet to a level area at the top of the stairs. Um, in the middle of that switchback, the ramp also encloses a kind of small garden, as much of a small garden as is possible in Windsor, maybe. Um, here's the thing, right? There don't need to be any stairs. A ramp like this can cost a quarter of a million dollars. The ramps are also often <coughs> unshoveled in winter, too tight for many wheelchairs to comfortably turn within. Moreover, they're to the side of the thoroughway for most students, and they send the message that access is unwieldy and an add-on. When they do get added on, they don't extend the aesthetic statement of the building, which would be possible if, for instance, the ramp were given trim to mirror the roof line of the hall, right? That's the major architectural statement of that building when you look at it head on. But the expense and the artlessness and the impracticality of the ramp speaks perfectly to this concept of the retrofit, and that's my second metaphor. It's not about removing the steep steps. In fact, in this case, they're adding more steps, right? Most other ramps are located in the back of buildings, sharing freight entrances, leading to freight elevators and other compromised pathways, sending the message that disability should come in the back door or should be off to the side. Retrofits are never value neutral, with the steps like those at Dillon Hall, so steeped in tradition, so connotative of the North American upward climb of elitism, especially on campus, ramps threaten the very idea of higher education. Also, despite the fact that equal access could be achieved relatively simply, the expense and labor of access and its cost, right, through this ramp and others like it, marks accessibility out as difficult, elaborate, and costly when it need not be. This reinforces the idea that access for most people is free and easy, and somehow the access needs of disabled people are extensive and expensive. So I'll talk more about those themes, but for now, that's the other metaphor to hold on to. Right? And in the kind of three little bears scheme here, I'm getting to the warm oatmeal, I guess, or the, the house made of bricks. Um, and that third metaphor is universal design. 
And the image I'm showing you uh, for this metaphor is the Canadian Museum of Human Rights in Winnipeg. Instead of the stairs we saw in the previous image, the center of this space, architecturally but also aesthetically, is a level entranceway into the center of the museum. We can see this level entranceway in, in the image that I've shown. The building itself looks like a large spiral with ribbons of stone and glass wrapping around it and narrowing towards the sky. But everyone comes in the same way on the ground level, and this spiraling and ribboning can be mirrored by the ramps throughout the space. The next slide shows on the interior a series of ramps that crisscross the interior of the space and provide a central metaphor for the argument the building is making and the stories it tells. This, sl this slide shows an overhead view of these crisscrossing ramps. The ramps take every visitor through the same journey. According their, to their promotional materials, quote, alabaster is one of three varieties of ancient stone that play a significant role in this museum. The museum's ramps are clad in this translucent white alabaster. Quarried in Spain, it is beautifully patterned with veins that might suggest blood vessels or other organic forms. The architect who described the building has described the ramps as, quote, a ribbon of circulation. Right? So you can see the difference. Right? In one version, we have an, an unstated set of values around steep steps. And we can find them all around a campus like Waterloo. In another version, to make that, that same campus up to spec, right, up to the legal uh, specifications, we add ramps, but the message they send is that the, the disability needs to come around the back or around the side, right? And the third alternative, our warm oatmeal slash brick house, right, is this idea that you can and should, especially nowadays, design space from the beginning to think about the broadest range of possible users, right? Um, the, on, the, on the Canadian Museum of Human Rights website, they define universal design for themselves. And they say it's not a design style, but an orientation design based on four premises. One, disability is not a special condition of a few. Two, disability is ordinary and affects most of us for some part of our lives. Three, if a design works well for people with disabilities, it works better for everyone. And four, usability and aesthetics are mutually compatible. So, I might have some counter-arguments to the, the rhetoric of some of these statements, um, but you can understand that sentiment that, that, uh, as a design orientation, right? So that a universal design then becomes the third metaphor, right? So, uh, as Brendan Gleeson has written, quote, disabled people in Western societies have been oppressed by the production of space. And that's, in a way, the, the first premise here. Space reproduces oppression, right? But as I will show, disability is a reality. It's also something that is in part produced, sometimes most powerfully by our uses of space, and especially spaces like a university, right? A university as a public space is also a place that shapes attitudes and ideas, right? Um, if, a, if a teacher, a, a professor, wants to, above all, treat students ethically and respectfully, they must consider the spaces where they teach in terms of disciplinary attitudes, but also in terms of bricks and mortar, walls and steps that exclude. And I want to move in this way away from this metaphor of the architectural and blend it, right? So that we can think of the disciplinary, the institutional, the administrative, the discursive, and the physical or architectural as in interaction. Right? So I think in that way we need to see the steep steps as an ideology. We need to see the retrofit as an ideology and a pattern on campus beyond just the buildings that we work in. Okay? So, to dig in a little bit more to the steep steps metaphor. Um, I think the steep steps put, puts forward the idea that access to the university is a movement upwards. That only the truly fit survive this climb. The steep steps lead to the ivory tower. And this tower is built upon standards. In many ways, I think this is an identity the university, above all other places, has embraced. I want to suggest that we've mapped the university in this way as a climb up steep steps for particular reasons. The steep steps metaphor sums up the way, ways that university constructs spaces, processes, ideologies that exclude. The self or selves that have been projected upon the space of the university are not just able-bodied and normal, but supposedly exceptional and elite. The university is a place for the very able. 
Not only have people with disabilities been traditionally seen as objects of study in higher education, rather than as teachers or students, not only has disability been a rhetorically produced stigma that could be applied to other marginalized groups to keep them out of the university, but the university is seen as performing the societal and cultural function of pulling some people slowly up the stairs, and it arranges others at the bottom of the steep incline. Right? So, in a way, universities are relied upon to step society, to de determine who has access to privilege. Right? Uh, I think Dylan Hall offers an interesting example. The key message it sends is that higher education requires students to ascend. If you can't climb those steps, you have no contact with the symbol system of the building. If I'm correct, Dylan Hall currently houses the Office of Disability Services, but in its basement. In this way, the steep steps have something pretty remarkable to say. Uh, I do want to say we don't have to isolate this search to the University of, Water of Windsor, right? seems as though, regardless of the architectural style, steep steps are integral, whether these are the wide marble sta staircases of Gothic buildings, or the brutalist concrete stairs and terraces scalloping out by the thousands on my own campus at the University of Waterloo. Has anybody been to the Waterloo campus? Right. Um, brutalism loves concrete, right? And they, they love a concrete stair form, right? So the buildings themselves, the, the argument they send is so often built around those stairs, which look also particularly ugly in the winter, um, <laughs> which it always, just always is, right? Um, so, okay, but, uh, um, okay. The other, uh, just as an aside, um, has anybody seen the movie Monsters University? When, they, when the animators um, looked for models, right, they looked at Stanford and Harvard. Um, they looked at these traditional buildings that look a lot like Dylan Hall. That's the idea of the university that they wanted, right? And there's a scene in that, at the very beginning of that movie, so it's a, that becomes an interesting metaphor, right? You have a very traditional campus with all of these stairs and gates, and then you take monsters and put them there, right? You have all these bodies that don't fit. Um, that's a, a metaphor for what the university is supposed to do, right? It's supposed to unfit some bodies, right? So in an early scene in Monsters University, there's a snail. And the snail is, or maybe, is it a snail? A slug. Um, the slug is very, very slowly getting to class, and you can hear the bells ringing and everybody else is rushing, and it's very clear that the snail is going to be late for class, right? Um, the campus doesn't fit for the snail, right? And then at the end of the movie, the very last scene of the movie, the snail is still in the same spot trying to get to class, right? Um, so in a way, that's a metaphor for not just like the physical structures of the university, but the time structures of the university. Um, okay. So, the reality is that on campus disability is present, right? We'll all become disabled at some point in our lives, right? But anywhere from 6 to 9% of undergraduate students report having a disability, and 35% of these are learning disabilities. I think we also need to assume that many students with invisible disabilities pass, hiding their disability or attempting to overcome it, right? And we need to interrogate that piece as well, because I think we might... While we might recognize and celebrate diversity on campuses, we should also recognize our roles um, in the ways in which we might avoid and disavow the very idea of disability, to give it no place. Um, and this avoidance and disavowal, I think, fits into that steep steps met uh, metaphorically. So the university sorts the population by a medicalized and legalized definition of ability as effectively now as it ever has. Universities continue to function to keep certain groups and individuals out of the workforce and away from status positions, away, for, away from knowledge and dialogue and power, and not just through omissions. So while 27% of Canadians have university degrees, only 17.6% Canadi of Canadians with mild or moderate disabilities have, to, have degrees. While recently more students with disabilities are enrolling than pre in previous eras, it takes students with disabilities at least 25% longer to complete the same degree re requirements as non-disabled students. Think of the metaphor of the slug. Um, disabled students are likely to have 60% more student debt by the time they graduate. As Sarah Muhammad reveals, debt is particularly onerous for students with disability who consequently require more time to complete their degree and this is a major contributing factor to persons with disabilities have, having lower application, admission, and graduation rates 
as well as higher rates of leaving and switching programs. But the statistics are skewed because they only account for the students who receive accommodations. What would the overall retention and graduation rates be for all students with disabilities regardless of documentation or accommodation? Because despite the fact that one in seven Canadians has a disability, only 2% of Canadian students actually seek disability accommodations. And unbelievably, 8% of Canadian college or universities have reported having no students with disabilities at all, which we know is impossible. Right? The simple extrapolation tells us that at least 100,000 and probably more like 200,000 Canadian post-secondary students need accommodations but never seek them. In the United States, some studies show that two-thirds of college, college students don't receive accommodations. Right? So they have a dis diagnosed disability, but they're not telling the university and not seeking their, uh, accommodations. Right? We also know that when they do seek accommodations, they wait until a point of crisis. They're likely to do so only in their third or fourth year of school. All right? um, and we should examine how and why. Right? And the economics is one place we should look. Right? The most recent survey of Disability Services Office showed that, quote, the average annual office budget was $257,289. Okay? The numbers in Canada are similar. That's the entire office budget. It's about what a dean makes, right? So a dean makes as much in a year as the average school spends on all students with disabilities. Right? You know what a growth area is? Deans. <laughs> right? They're multiplying. Resources for students with disabilities are not, right? Um, so, the other piece of that is that there are barely more than 200 professionals employed to provide disability accommodations at Canadian colleges and universities, right? So the rough student-to-staff ratio is somewhere between 1 to 250. At my own university, a point of pride recently has been that they got that ratio down to 1 to 1,000, right? So you have... Case, full-time caseworkers, right, about three of them for, for the 3,000 students who are seeking accommodations at a school of 30,000. That's a problem, right? So, so that could be part of the picture for why students are not seeking help because these offices are not going out and advertising their services, right, because they don't have the capacity. That's one small piece, right? Um, but I think stigma is the, is the major barrier, right? In the United States, they found that 94% of students with a diagnosed learning disability in K-12, to right, in uh, public school and high school, got accommodations for that learning disability. Only 17% of those same students who went to university got an accommodation in university. So you have a situation in which students got to the point of getting into university through the accommodations that they had, and then did not seek those accommodations. Hardly any of them sought those accommodations when they went to university, right? We should attribute some agency to that, right? I think when you go to university, it's a time to get to reinvent yourself, right? You get to determine who you want to be. And maybe not the first thing you want to do is go and seek an accommodation, right? The identity you want to have may not be through your disability, right? But there's a problem when those same students are not seeking the help that they needed. Because I think we could also say, if we see university, uh, if we see disability as in part socially constructed, university, how did I say that? Did I just jumble that all up? Let me try it. Start it all over again. If we see disability as in part socially constructed, right? University constructs disability more, right? The environment here, where students are away from the kind of support networks, structure, routines that they might have had to help them through K-12. to Those things are absent in university. There's a higher level of stress. All of these other factors that can exacerbate the issue. And they're still not seeking help. Okay. So, the thing that I would urge everybody to do, um, if not today, at some other point, right? think of that metaphor as of the steps. And if you can, think of a two-dimensional image of steps going up like this. Okay? Because I think it's really important to try and locate ourselves where we think we are on those stairs, right? Where did we start on those stairs? Before we even came to university, some people started on a higher step than others, right? What are the factors that allowed us to be on the step that we started on, right? And what are the forces pushing people up and pushing people back? 
How have we experienced that feeling of being pushed back, right? How have we pushed back? How have we experienced the, the, the opportunity to be pushed up? How have we pushed other people up, right? It's not a static metaphor. It's something that's happening all the time, right? Okay, that's the first metaphor. So the second is a retrofit, because we've got all these old buildings, we've got a very conservative but also a ableist space in which disability is not part of the culture on campus. What do we do? Um, and I'm especially interested to get the perspective of students in this room who might be able to see this from a social service perspective, from a law legal perspective, right? Because all of those things are part of the picture. My metaphor is of the retrofit, right? And you can recall that's the ramp on the side of the building or around the back of the building, right? And if we look at what a retrofit is, basically it allows something to pass a legal requirement, right? We retrofit factories and cars so that they don't pollute too much, right? Um, it's a way to add an element so that something passes, a te passes the test, right? But the entailment of that is that it's often the very minimum. Right? So a retrofit through something like the AODA or the Americans with Disability Act mandates uh, a reasonable accommodation, right? but it's a minimal accommodation. Um, and often it's a, it's a floor, but it's also a ceiling. Right? That's how retrofits work. It's not just that you do the minimum, it's that you only do the minimum. Right? So I'll give you an example. Um, on, on a regular syllabus, disability is a retrofit already, right? It's you take a regular syllabus and you slap a disability accommodation statement onto it, right? Most people do that in a boilerplate way. In fact, some universities say you're not allowed to change it, right? So there's a, a mandate of not doing more or offering more, right? When I was an undergrad, not here at Windsor, when I was at UBC and I took American literature courses, Toni Morrison was a retrofit in week 12, right? It was a way to say, this is a diverse syllabus. But it was also a way of saying, no, it's all white dudes, and if we run out of time, it will continue to be all white dudes, right? So there's a statement that that, that diversity, like that, that the different voice, right, the way that that might change the conversation, is an afterthought, right? Um, that's how a retrofit works. It sends the message that this is an add-on. Right? That this is not something you should be thinking about. Right? So I like to gather, um, I like to gather um, game metaphors um, or, or like um, toy metaphors uh, for, for this process. And I'll give you a couple of them. Right? Well, one of them, the, the metaphor is that the ways that retrofits work, students have to go and seek an accommodation. They need a medical diagnosis to get it. Right? Even if they had a medical diagnosis at the high school level, they need a new one now and it costs money to get one, right? That's a barrier to begin with, right? But they need to renegotiate and renegotiate accommodations over and over again, right? Semester after semester, year after year. So it's like Las Vegas, right? What accommodations that happens for a student stays in one class, stays in that class, right? And it doesn't transfer, right? But the other piece about that is that I believe a lot of professors feel that way. They think, if I don't have a letter from Accessibility Services, I don't have any students with disabilities in my class. We've already gone over why that's wrong, right? It's untrue. Statistically impossible that in any given class on this campus, there's not students with disabilities, right? But the idea of the retrofit is that if you don't have that documentation, it doesn't exist, right? And also that you make a temporary stopgap fix for that student. So the game I think of is Whack-A-Mole. Has anybody ever played Whack-A-Mole? Right? It's this game where you're at a table and the moles pop up and then you hit them with a hammer. Right? So that's how disability gets approached. When it pops up, you hit it with a, with a diagnosis and an accommodation and you hope it goes away. Right? There's no lasting pedagogical change, no lasting cultural change. Instructors aren't asked to say what accommodations you gave in that class you have to carry forward because they might make you a better teacher, right? The process tells you not to do that, in fact, right? The big piece of it is students are seen as asking for something out of the ordinary, right? Just like that ramp, it's seen as something that's expensive in terms of time and effort and money, right? It's seen as, uh, the students are also seen as perhaps jumping the queue, Right? Or getting an unfair advantage. 
It's very interesting, right? Because we spend so much money as a culture on education and higher education. And all of it is seen as an investment. Every single thing I do for students is justified as an investment in their future, except for disability accommodations, which get constructed as a drain on resources, right? Which get constructed as, a, as something that we should be skeptical of their veracity, right? That we should be calling for different versions of proof for the need for them over and over again, right? So the other metaphor that I think is important for us to think about as teachers is the game Battleship. People played the game Battleship. So Battleship is a game where you have a, a game board, but it's divided in half. Uh, so if I'm playing with Professor Jacobs, then on their side of the board, there are a bunch of different locations, right? And I'm trying to lob stuff over to land on one of those other uh, locations, but I can't see where anything's landing. That's the experience for many students of going into the Office of Disability Services. They're lobbing a diagnosis over and hoping that it lands on an accommodation that will help them. But they don't know what the range or repertoire of accommodations is. And they don't know how they'll be implemented. Right? So, and they have to do this game all over again all, all, every semester. Right? So, the other piece about that is that, truly, the accommodations on the other side are really limited. There's only a few squares there. Right? 90% of accommodations offered, offered by Office of Disability Services are, are extended time on tests and exams. Right? I, I want to say a couple of things about that. I teach in an English department, so I don't administer tests or exams. Right? So I can look at it and congratulate myself. And in fact, I think a lot of professors do. They say, oh, I'm not doing anything that might cause inaccessibility. Right? I have an accessible class because these things don't apply to me. Right? The logic of the retrofit encourages you to do that instead of saying, wow, this game is rigged. Right? There needs to be a wider repertoire of accommodations that I offer. The Office of Disability Services doesn't even know that I do collaborative work or group work or experiential learning or all these other buzzwords that universities care about. Offices of Disability Services don't have the game pieces for that. Right? So we have a responsibility to, to tell them about what we're doing in the classroom, better mirror what's happening in the classroom, so that the range of accommodations can expand. Right? Similarly, the other main accommodation is um, oral or digital versions, of print versions of lectures. Right? Well, I don't lecture. Right? If we see the class not as a place where we take knowledge and like put it into student brains, then the Office of Disability Services doesn't have a lot to offer. If we see, for instance, knowledge is being generated collaboratively in the classroom through group work, right, through shared projects, then we have to have a different process for accommodation. The issue, though, is that retrofitting tells us not to, right? And it, in fact, constructs it as legally risky to do more than the minimum, all right? Um, okay. So, I do want to say, I work really closely with the Office of Disability Services at my school. Right? And I realize the constraints under which they're working. And I know that we still need retrofits, just like we still need ramps. Right? Without them, all you have is steep stairs everywhere. Right? But we have to get to a point where we're doing more than just constantly retrofitting. All right? And so then I'm on to my warm oatmeal brick, which is supposed to be universal design. Right? Have people heard of the, of the idea of universal design before? So it's a movement that began in architecture, right? And Ronald Mason and his colleagues at North Carolina State University came up with these principles for architecture for the broadest range of possible bodies, right? So that you build a space, for instance, that accommodates somebody from the moment they're born until the moment they pass away, right? And all the changes that, that, go, that, that a body experiences in that time, right? Instead of a building that, that doesn't, right? Um, and very quickly, those architectural principles became principles that we use to design learning environments, right? Universal design for learning, and I have a slide about this, there's three basic ideas, right? And all of it is about variety, right? So there are multiple means of representation. So that means, for instance, today, I'm speaking, we have CART, there are large print copies, there's a website, right? I have multiple ways that I'm representing what I'm saying to you, right? And a lot of those accommodations, they're, they're retrofits, right? But 
they're really useful. There's an uh, idea in, in universal design that's called positive redundancy, right? And that is, it's positive to have multiple versions of something, right? Um, that provides another concept, which is this idea of um, tolerance for error, right? So universally designed spaces and products have tolerance for error. What that means is you have a variety of ways to get things right, to understand things, right? And if you only have one pathway, then there are some people that are not going to get there. So, for instance, I'll point out the doorknob over here, right? The doorknob on this door is old school. It's this, you know, the, the, an actual knob, like circular knob. That's not universal design. We don't build doors like that anymore because they don't have tolerance for error. Right? If I have all of my bags and things and I go up to that doorknob, I can't open it. Right? Even just those handles that come out like on an angle, I can hit that with my butt, I can hit it with my knee, right? I can hit it with my elbow. It has tolerance for error. Right? A door that has one of those bars that you can push to open it has even more tolerance for error. Right? A door with a button has even more. A door that combines all those things has even more. Right? And we know of that now as just good design. Right? So universities don't buy doors like that anymore, I hope. But we also need to think about that in terms of how we structure learning. Another piece is that there needs to be multiple means of expression. And that means multiple ways for the students in your class to show and to shape the conversation, right? to engage. And so one example might be those cue cards. Right? I learned... Um, I'm old enough that when I first started teaching, it was like the birth of um, message boards in teaching. That really dates me, right? But I remember having discussions in classes. I had a short 50-minute class and a great group of students, but there were a couple of students in the class who had really bad body language, and I always cue in on those students. I'm like, what's going on? Why don't they like me, right? But I also want them to be involved because I know that so much of the class is that participation, right? So I'm constantly trying to figure out how can I get them engaged. And when I first started using message boards in the classroom to extend the conversation, those two students in that first class, they went nuts on the message board, right? So many smart things to add on the message board, but they were not going to put their hand up in class, right? So that, was, that made me realize, okay, that was not necessarily the student's fault, right? And if, I, if my goal is to get everybody to talk, right, so that everybody shapes the conversation and get all of those viewpoints out, then I need to have a way to extend that, right? So I've used the, the cue cards as that. You can use message boards for that. Multiple means for students to join the conversation and shape the conversation. And then finally, the third piece is multiple means for students to show how smart they are, to show what they've learned, right? So if we're evaluating something, we need to think carefully about what the parameters are around that evaluation. Right? I talked about how much students have to fight to show that they deserve a minimal accommodation. I get really frustrated because professors never have to prove why they're using a test, a type of test. Right? So that's really frustrating to me. There's no good research that shows that a time to test makes students study harder, allows students to reveal what they know better, or allows students to retain that information or that knowledge later. Nothing. There's no studies. People have been studying this for decades, and yet we still keep giving time tests. Why do professors not have to prove that the test is a, is a good means, right? In fact, what the, and there's a study that looks at this in law school, the only thing that time tests are good for is retaining, um, how do I put it? Let me, find, I, don't, I don't have, I think I have it as a footnote. I want to get the wording right. Give me one second. I'm going to skip it. See, I told you I need to read from the page where I get disoriented. Basically, all that time tests do in law school is um, make sure that the, the hierarchy and stratification of privilege is retained. Right? All that they really do is reinforce privilege that already exists. Right? So, students of color, minority students, students or first generation college students, all the students for whom it's already very difficult to break into that school and that profession, all that time tests do is make sure that they continue to be at a disadvantage. Right? Okay. All right. So, um, that's
that said, I'm talking about universal design. Um, it's not, there are issues, right? There are issues with saying we're all disabled in some way, right? There are ways to trouble universal design, and I do that in some of my other work. But for the, our purposes today, I want to think about, um, we've moved from thinking about those steep steps, right, to thinking about those accommodations. So another piece would be, what are some accommodations that you make for yourself, right? What are the secrets for you in terms of how you study, right? In terms of the support networks you have, right? In terms of those little academic survival skills like going to office hours, right? Um, or knowing your something about your professor's research, right? What are those little things that you do to create ramps around those steep steps? Or if, you, if some of you have experience as teachers, what are some of the accommodations that work for students in your class that you have denied, that you have refused to treat like Las Vegas, right? That you've said, I am going to bring this from this class into another, right? That's how we start getting to the point of universal design. When we allow those retrofits over time to change the classroom, right? So we stop using the steep stairs altogether and so that everybody is coming in through the same entrance, right? There's a principle in disability studies that's called the electronic curve cut effect. Has anybody heard of this before? Was it, who has a smartphone? All right. Every single cool thing that your smartphone does was originally designed for someone with a disability. And it was a niche thing that cost a lot of money, right? So optical character recognition, GPS, um, speech to text, or text to speech, all those cool things, every app that you have there is based in some way on a technology that was originally a niche thing for someone with a disability, right? That's what, in disability studies, we call the electronic curve cut effect. The interesting thing is that so many of these things that we now take for granted, they began as accommodations that were seen as out of the ordinary, right? Out of the mainstream, right? The problem is sometimes once the mainstream gets something, you stop caring about the fact that whether it continues to include disabled people, that's one of the problems with universal design as well, right? And I see this on campus sometimes when professors say, my class is so accessible that students don't need to use the Office of Disability Services, right? That's a problem too, right? Because it takes the agency and the advocacy away from the students, right? But that idea of the electronic curb cut effect, the idea that the things that we might do in a class that we see as accommodations and temporary, if we make them permanent, right, we'll find ways that they, that they help all students. We'll find ways that they help us as teachers as well. Right? So it's the move to try and think about those things in that way. Okay. All right. That's my, my three little bears, right? Like it's supposed to be so neat and tidy now, right? But I have a little bit more time, and I'm going to make things more complicated, right? It may be a little uncomfortable. I'm good at that, right? Um, because I think it's important to say that to go back to what we were talking about at the beginning and to begin to interrogate how we are part of this culture as well, okay? And it is an ableist culture. Um, I think it's important to recognize and understand that for decades, people with disabilities were studied. Right? They were objects of study, continue to be. Right? They are not purveyors of knowledge. They're not shapers of the culture of higher education. Right? And that is built into the bones of a university. Right? But it's also how universities grew, right? based on that kind of research. And we could, we could, we could look to the, the nutritional experiments that were done by, by kids at residential schools. We could look to the research relationships between higher education and institutions like Rideau Center, Southwestern, Huroni Regional Center, right, where class actions have just revealed decades of abuse, but they've also started to reveal that those were research sites for researchers, right? In fact, the CPRI, the Child Psychiatric Research Institute in London, was built because researchers at Western were tired of driving to Aurelia to have access to research subjects, right? Research subjects who did not consent to that research, right? So I think that foundation is something we can't forget and we need to understand. Um, the other piece about that is that, you know, nowadays, well, academics, it's, it's a very popular and uh, it's something that, that gains you social capital as a researcher to talk about health, wellness, the body, right? Those same researchers will rarely talk about disability studies, rarely 
engage with the authority of disabled people on those matters, and rarely locate their work within disability studies or disability rights. So universities create doctors and special educators and therapists who learn how to rehabilitate or cure or eradicate disability, or how to tokenize it or minimally exclude it, include it. Seeing disability as fixable or curable is very different from seeing disability as desirable or understanding disability subjectivity as adding diversity. So in short, educating people to erase and diminish disability, that ensures limitations for all of us on how we understand bodies and minds. That said, that, that continued struggle, the way that we're locked in this retrofitting model, the struggle to fight for small accommodations, ensures that people that we're kind of in the area right now where people with disabilities are still fighting for the right to study at all. So we need to recognize that long history, but we also need to recognize what's happening right now. Um, I want to address in the final bit of time that we have, and hopefully we can bring this up as part of the discussion, in my book, Academic Ableism, which as, as mentioned, there's an open access version, so if anybody wants to, to have a look at it, you can. There's a, there's a section in the beginning of the book, because when I wrote the book, one of the pieces of feedback that I got was, this is really great and I agree with it, but this isn't going to do anything the way that it's written. And their point was, for people who understand academia as ableist, they get it. Everybody else in higher education is so inured and trained against admitting to that ableism that they're sort of the, the range of ways that they will deflect and not engage will mean this book will have no impact, right? And I kind of, it hit pretty hard, but it's very true, right? Everybody, is, the people who would come to a talk like this, right, are not always the people that we need to engage with, right? So part of that, I think, means that everybody in this room has to understand the ableism that we've internalized, right? How we are part of that system. But we also need to think about the ways that the folks we work with will apologize for ableism. Right? I think one of the big pieces of that is just that the elitism of the university becomes an apology for ableism. Right? So we can think of the variety of different apologies, and there's a rhetorical genre called apologia, which is all the different ways that we apologize for things in order to refuse to address them structurally. Right? And I think there's a, there's a, that's a big piece of the university culture, is saying, of course, my job is to fail some students. Right? without investigating whether that failure, right, is based on fairness, right, or is based on an understanding of what you're failing students for, right? Are, you, are we failing students because of a true meritocracy, right? Nobody is, is forced to in, in investigate or interrogate that, right? And it's interesting to me because one of the things I study is popular conceptions of university from outside of the university. Right? So I look at like popular films, really bad movies about universities, right? but also public discourse. And I think it's worth saying, it, given the new government, that we have a very populist government in Ontario that's going to be dictating university budgets and what happens on university campuses. So how the general public sees university is something we need to engage with. One thing that I find interesting is the general public thinks, really distrusts universities. Right? All the big movies or stories that get told about university, they drop out. They drop out, right? In general, that's the story people want to hear about a university, is that it is a false meritocracy, right? That it's this really conservative space where you go to party, right? And to be kind of discriminated against, right? And so we need to engage with that, especially if part of what we're trying to do is critique it as a false meritocracy, right? Um, I just think, I think that that becomes really important. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is that the ableism on campus is a problem that, sorry, it, it's a problem that, that in that those people who are most likely not to do the work of dismantling ableis, ableism are those in non-precarious and secure positions. So this is literal, I mean this literally as well. Non-tenure faculty, particularly non-tenure track female faculty, are those most likely to accommodate as, though, as well as those more likely to adopt universal design principles. The research shows that, right? Younger faculty are more likely to accommodate than older and more established faculty. 
Those most in need of the dismantling of ableism are kept away from the opportunity to even point it out, or kept in positions in which their objections can be effectively diffused. Right? The same people who are most likely to, to, to reshape the university are the people who are kept away from the power to do that reshaping. Right? Um, and I think the other piece of that is that those who, are, who get even a kind of tiny taste of the ableist power of the institution, they carefully and perhaps even subconsciously guard that power, right? Because it's the power that gave them their privilege in the first place, right? To dismantle the ableism of the university means admitting to a system that gave us privilege unfairly. And people guard that very closely, right? So the point is to try to find ways to get the stakeholders in higher education to engage with, understand, and take action to address this, right? It's a difficult thing for people to dis consider because it's so much a part of their own identity, right? Okay. All right, so I think there's a lot of work to do. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things that I, questions I've raised here um, and that I've left open, but I hope that we can discuss some of these things. I do want to point out that on the website, I have offered a, a long list of things we can do now we can start doing now, right? An appendix to the book is a list of thousands of universal design ideas for teaching. And the way I usually present that to people is there are places to start. Try one idea, right, in your classroom. There's a wide variety of different classroom settings, so labs, field trip, all kinds of stuff, right? So you can't say this doesn't look like my classroom, right? That's one piece, one place to start. Right? Another thing is to take the accommodations that have worked for you and apply them for others. Right? Don't let the classroom be Las Vegas. Right? With the accommodations that you've used for students, allow those to reshape the classroom. Right? There are other resources there around disabled faculty members. Right? And the, the issues around disclosure, the issues around access to accommodations for disabled faculty members. Because while a talk like this that focuses on students that's the most common way that we'll even talk about this, right? It becomes much harder to talk about graduate students who often get caught in the middle. It becomes really hard to talk about among faculty, right? Because the stigma among faculty is very, very high. Um, there are pieces there around um, uh, how, how we might present our work at conferences, right? There are pieces there around... Um, uh, blanking on all the resources because I can't see the website when it's up. Um, in any case, the point being, there are a bunch of different places that we can start, right? Um, yeah, hiring process, all kinds of things. All right, so we, I think we have got lots of time for questions, and I'm going to maybe, is it okay if I sit down for the question part? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. There are the note cards too, so please, please uh, write questions on the note cards, and maybe we can collect some note cards as well. Maybe another way to put it is, um, I'm open to uh, questions, rants, um, ideas. Uh, reflections, right? So any variety of those things. So, um, I know you looked at stuff in the U.S. as well. Did you find? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Do you find a big difference in the U.S. between um, like accessibility offices with private and public universities? Because my my husband and his sister are both visually impaired. And he went to Temple, which is a public school, but his sister went to Cabrini, and it's like night and day. Like, she had no access, and he actually had, like, decent access, although, as you said, he didn't use any of it, because he wanted to sort of, like, start fresh in college and didn't want to access it. But, yeah, you said it was a like huge difference between the public and private funding. Yeah, so there's a variety of... Those differences are all really interesting, too, because, in a way... So if you're willing to go along with the idea that disability is in part socially constructed, it's a, it's a physical and material reality, right, that affects bodies in, in, in different ways, right? And, and it's a vector of oppression, but it's also in ways constructed, right? It's, it's built by the, the ways we interact with one another in the social environment. 
So if we see that as true, then the differences in Office, Office of Disability Services become actually really interesting because they show how much retrofitting can actually impact things. So a couple things. One, um, even in Canada, where an Office of Disability Services is located really matters. So if it's off, operated out of student success, that is a very different modality that's oriented around things like retention and accountability around things like retention. That's what student success offices get their money based on, right? If it's operated out of counseling services or medical services, that's very different, as you can imagine, right? Someone who runs counseling services, and if your Office of Disability Services is accountable to that person, it's a very different model. Unfortunately, that's often a caseload model. Because in counseling services, they're so overwhelmed, what they really want is people to effectively and efficiently see as many people as they can. Right? So you get rewarded, you get offices that are pretty efficient, right, at, at bureaucracy. If you have an office, and this is rare, but actually this is again my warm oatmeal slash brick house version, you can have offices more often in the states where equity, the director of equity is the person you're accountable to, or the office of diversity. As you can imagine, that's a different model too, right? Because the different um, modes of accountability for that are different than they are in the other places. In the States, what I find interesting is, in Ontario, well, even the difference between Waterloo and Windsor, I bet there's a key difference. One difference is, Waterloo doesn't care about recruitment. They get new, more students apply to Waterloo every year than the year before. And the average of those students coming in is higher every year than it was the year before. So they don't give a crap about students. Why would they? Right? Not to be too cynical, but there's no, there's no repercussion if a student fails out. In fact, what the faculty knows is next year a smarter student will take that student's place. So they're invested in sorting, right? And the, the funding model in Ontario is based on the number of student bodies you have, the number of and international students are obviously, they pay more tuition, so they're even more valuable, right? And there's a whole lack of support around that. So I should, I should mention that, right? It's something that's omitted as part of the talk, but, you know, imagine yeah. a student has to get a diagnosis and has no acquaintance with the healthcare system. And in fact, for most international students, they don't even have OHIP. They have to pay for health insurance, right? So all those different barriers that I talked about, are experienced even more for those students, who on, on the inverse are more valuable because they're tuition dollars, but even more replaceable because there are even more international students who want to come than there are domestic students, right? So, long rant. <laughs> but in the States, at least, they have to really compete for students. A lot of schools really have to compete for students. So the student experience becomes a big deal. And you find interesting things in the States. You have entire universities like Landmark that are their whole angle is we want autistic students. We want learning disabled students, right? So their whole, that's their whole marketing. That's everything that they do, right? I mean, it becomes a segregated type of place, right? And you get a situation at public schools where you have a student in your class and a faculty member will call them a landmark student, right? Because they'll think they should be there. Um, but the other thing is that in some states, you get funding based on retention. So you actually have to do things that make students want to stay. Right? The issue in the states is that deans and provosts and administrators have learned how to gain that. So what they do is they make sure and not recruit students who might possibly leave. And that means they recruit only from certain zip codes. Right? So that starts to, to it, it, it down, like, whatever, ableism is pretty malleable, you know? So whatever it is that you do to try and fix it, it finds a new way, right? But I do honestly, a soapbox issue for me, but I honestly believe that it, in Ontario, um, if there were some other ways, even a small percentage of the budget, that, of the grant that universities get from the province, if a little bit, bit of it had to be you show that students graduate, you show that students stay, right, that they're not dropping out left and right, that would be a thing that actually makes campuses change a little bit. Right now, there's no incentive at all to change. In fact, the economic incentive is to keep things the way, the way that they are. And universities, even though, like, um, 
you know, lots of people want to say that universities are full of, like, radicals. They're highly conservative places. Right? They're very resistant to change. Long rant answer. I have a question. Sure. Yeah, and, um, you know, uh, thank you for the talk. I really appreciate it. Um, I think about uh, what you were just saying and kind of incentivizing. Sorry. Absolutely, yeah. I think about what you were just saying and kind of incentivizing. Um, and your notions about incentivizing kind of stem or, uh, you know, they find some root within the broader university uh, structure. Um, I'm just trying to think about the average university professor and how we might incentivize that university professor to have a more um, universal design in their syllabus and their approaches to teaching. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were in terms of how to do that. Mm -hmm. That's a terrific question. That's a, like that figure is it would be interesting rhetorically, right? Think about that as your audience for, for a lot of this. One piece I think is that that. Well, it's like University of Waterloo, they say that they're like the, the innovation university, right? Every time the president talks, it's about innovation, right? Waterloo probably has, or Windsor probably has buzzwords like that too. I don't know what they are, but it's always around innovation and change and all that kind of stuff, right? And then they just don't. <laughs> um, they have to wait and see other people do it first. That's, what, that's Waterloo as, an, as a school. Like, we even have the old version of... Um, of the course management system because people won't agree to change. So it has like doesn't even have all these functions that other schools have because people are like, oh, I like the old one. It's fine, right? And we're the school of innovation, right? But I think that's the case for that average professor, right? It's effort and it's risk to change. And they've been rewarded by a system that they know and understand. And that's why, you know, um, even, I see this so often at the graduate level, like grad advisors who try to recreate themselves over and over again. That's part of the function of the conservatism of the university. You reward the things you got rewarded for, right? And you imagine a world in which everybody learns exactly like you do, right? And you've been told, like, you're supposed to tell them, it's supposed to not be a mystery. You should say, what are the things that work for you and share that and convey that to people, right? But what that does is it rubber stamps a very conservative way of doing things. But I think as a teacher, I've become better and better by the degree to which I've let go of my way of learning as the best way. Has anybody else in here ever lived with somebody who's in school at the same time as them? Or even more specifically, have you ever lived with somebody who's working on an assignment deadline? Doesn't it, isn't it just unbelievably impossible because you know how to manage your own stress, right? And you know what your process is, but like living with somebody else, and then you're like, why aren't you working on this right now? Uh, how does that search term not have an and and quotation marks in it? You know, like, just your way of doing things becomes the only way, and anything else just causes you anxiety, like, by proxy, right? But what you really learn in the end is, like, there's another way of doing it. My way is not the way that person is learning. And if I made them do it my way, it would drive them the same way that, you know what I mean? So you have to let go of that. But so much of the culture, again, my answers are like half an hour long. But <laughs> let me get to the answer. I think you have to show them. Honestly, you have to set up situations where they can see their colleagues taking risks, right? Where they can see, you need to almost like, it's cheesy, but you need like ambassadors. You need versions and varieties of ways of sharing these ideas, right? Um, because people don't just try it on their own, right? Uh, when we tried to do things at Waterloo and we got really stalled on it, um, but what we wanted to do was take some of these ideas as like places to start and create accessible videos that showed them how they worked, right? Because I think, you know, in a department you think, who is the person in this department who maybe some people would follow Right? if they took some risks and they showed that they were doing this. Right? I think another big piece for faculty would be you get, in the, in the, um, uh, you get, you get things put into the evaluation of instruction. Right? It's really hard to do with faculty unions and associations. Right? Or you get it put into, you get individual departments who are willing to build some of that into their review process. Right? That, that faculty have to write up what their activity is in a given year, right? Part of it is faculty have to start modeling that too, 
you know, that's, I, I try to do that. I try to provide more than just student evaluations. I try to buy, uh, provide assignment examples that are universally assigned. I try to do more of that, right? Um, but there's not a lot, there's not a lot of incentive for doing that. So I do think, honestly, some of it is exemplars. The other piece is professors don't want to be told what they're not doing or, or told what they're doing poorly. So part of it can be that approach of saying, I bet you're already doing something that's really good. <laughs> Question at the back? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question is, I'm actually 
not a law student. I, I took EA at college last year, and there is a huge difference even working in school systems. Like, children with special needs or even just lower intellectual needs, they're encouraged to go to college because it's hands-on. It's, uh, we did a lot of gifts teaching and taught each other. The university is so different. It's, I mean, Blackboard now is a huge change from the first time I was here and get my lectures and stuff like that. But if you can't learn by yourself, it's hard to be here. How do we change that? Yeah, I think about, I have, I have a nephew who came to University of Waterloo and I checked in with him in his first week. He's in this nano engineering program. And I said, have you met other people in the program? And he's like, yeah. You know, I went, he went to like a very elitist school, a private school that was very competitive in high school. And he said, yeah, I checked in and I said, ask some people if they wanted to go over some of our readings together. And they said to me, this is Waterloo. That was their response, right? Um, and that is, that's a real attitude, right? Um, is, is that you must do it on your own. It's this bootstraps mentality, right? And it valorizes how tough it's supposed to be, you know? Like, I think a lot of people, there's, but I have faculty colleagues who would hear that same story and kind of s smile, right? And be like, yeah, that is the culture here, right? And you either make it or you don't. Um, it's like Waterloo just got, was ranked number one or number two in the, in the nation in reputation. I think, what is that reputation? People love it. They like it. Parents want to send their students, their kids here, right? But that reputation is work on your own. Do it on your own, right? To me, also, it gets to, like, a real difference in the philosophy of education, right? So I think, I think a lot of K-12 teachers, their philosophy of education is that it's a public service, it's a public good, right? And that whatever group of students, maybe less than less, but whatever group of students walk in the door, that's it, right? That's who they have and they gotta figure it out, right? And they spend so much time with them that they know that that's a, also a culture, right? Like the degree to which they all, they all, they get everybody working together is the degree to which they're gonna have success but I don't think a lot of university teachers feel that way, right? And the other piece is I don't think that they feel that um, the classroom is a place that generates knowledge. I think they think of it as a place where they give their knowledge to students, and students either get it or not, right? And their job is to test it. It gets to the same, the same profs who have so much trouble the idea of sharing their lecture notes, right? Well, that's a major issue if you really believe that the most important thing you have is your lecture notes. <laughs> Nowadays, especially, like, that it's an intellectual property issue that you are so brilliant that the things you say shouldn't be shared, right? Or that somebody has to be in a room for, for only that 50 minutes, right? As you say it, right? When it, it's only good right off the top of your dome, right? Like, that's when it's best, right? Like, that it couldn't be valuable later. Or that the that, that knowledge that, that you're conveying is the thing, right? I think in K-12 to there's a little bit less of that, right? Although maybe as we start teaching towards tests and things like that, it's, it's not. But um, I actually think there's a lot that universities could learn from K-12, to right? From colleges as well, I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Hi. So um, I used a scooter um, for my undergrad at Waterloo, and I could kind of go on about all the different things like I encountered, like the only way to get somewhere without using stairs was blocked by a goose nest. So I got to by a goose, and just different stories like that. Um, that's so Waterloo. Yeah, and they slap on like a, a door button, and that's fine. But okay, there's another door inside that opens this towards me and the buttons over there when I'm in that foyer, like I've been trapped in foyers a few times. Um, so that's just kind of high water loop. But um, something that you mentioned is that for the retrofit um, model or whatever, it's legally risky to do more than the minimum. I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit more, just briefly. Yeah, so when I was at West Virginia University, which is where I was before, before Waterloo, 
uh, I, I administered a big writing program. So 4,000 students a year took, went through this writing program. And so no lectures, no tests, no exams. And, and so I thought, I need to go and talk to disability services and say, 4,000 students a year are taking this course. Let's expand the range of accommodations. What can we do for students that's, that we're not just slapping this on because it's a, it's a waste of time, right? That's not actually helping. And it was just a very difficult situation, right? Because of the legal language, what we had to create was, was an addendum to the accommodation letter, right? And the language had to be very clear that none of these things were legally mandated, right? And that none of them could replace the things on the accommodation letter, right? So we had to instead act like what we were given were the things that didn't work, right? Because those were the things that the lawyers had agreed were the minimal accommodations, right? And again, it's very conservative. Like, nobody wants to be the one who does it differently, right? But we did create this addendum, and what it had was a range of what we could only call suggestions, right? So none of it could have any teeth, right? None of it could be actually utilized in that way. And if a student didn't get any of those things, they had no recourse, right? Um, but that's, I mean, still it was worth doing, right? It was like a ramp on a ramp or something. Um, but it was still worth doing. Like, I think it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting rhetorical exercise to take any accommodation letter, right, as a teacher and, like, take a pen and write in all the other things that you wish were on it, right? Or that a student could actually help a student, right? And then start aiming, start working and aiming towards expanding that repertoire of accommodations. Too often it's just a rubber stamp, right? And so you have to have things that work for students that become a bigger part of that range. And make it not battleship, right? Somebody has to be asking what's actually on the other side of the board. Right? And there have to be more options over there that actually help. And, and use the university's own language, right? So, like, when the president talks about experiential learning and, and hands-on and all these other things that they want to talk about, say, okay, well, what's the accommodation for that? You know, as much as possible. Um, but it's hard. It's difficult. Okay, um, so I was in a wheelchair earlier this year, as I discussed earlier on when we were talking. Um, but unfortunately, it was a manual wheelchair. I've noticed that a lot of the accommodations that are made for wheelchair access is made for electric wheelchairs. I believe that society needs to stop, think, and think about like other people that are coming to this country. We're supposed to be accessible to everybody. And we're having a lot more people coming from different countries that aren't going to have access to a automatic wheelchair, but we'll have to use a manual wheelchair. What are your suggestions and how we can, as student bodies and individuals in the community, bring these awareness, awareness to society as a whole? Mm -hmm. So there's like a practical, really straightforward way of saying that, and that is, so there's a thing that University of Toronto does, it's called the Great Barrier Hunt. Um, and every year they have a group called Students for Barrier Free Access, and every year they go around campus and they take pictures and they shame the university on the most inaccessible parts of the university, right? And it's really effective, actually, because that's a very traditional university, but universities hate bad PR, right? So one thing is, if you notice that a ramp is not, for instance, shoveled in the winter, take a picture and tag physical plant. Take a picture and tag the dean of that college. Say, what are you doing about this, right? You've got to be a troublemaker when you can and, and there are more, actually more levers for that now, and more levers for students to do that now than you think. And universities hate bad PR. Even tiny little bits of bad PR, right? Like a tweet that gets two likes, they're freaked out about it, right? So you have to use those levers when you can. But I think the other piece of that is that it's not just that disability is only seen as, for instance, maybe people in electric wheelchairs, right? it's that it's only seen as physical disability. Right? So even that's a major problem with the metaphors I'm using today. That's why I want you to see them as more than just metaphors. It's not ramps, right? It's not just physical disability, right? It's a stigma around talking about psychological 
issues. It's, a, it's, the, it's the ways universities want to talk about mental health or wellness, right? As though they're things they want to get rid, they want to get rid of um, different ways of thinking on campus, right? They want to get rid of brains that aren't normal, right? Like it's Strive Week, so it's Wellness Week on my own campus right now, right? And so faculty and students, what we do is we blog against, or we, we uh, tweet against Thrive every day. Right? Because those same movements that valorize wellness, um, they stigmatize difference. Right? And they, they camouflage structural issues. They camouflage the, the things that make students unwell. Right? They camouflage issues that make students leave. So I think that's like again another big answer, but I think I think we have to help people expand what they understand of disability itself, right? That it's more than just physical access too. What are the things that, that make a building or a class or a meeting or a social event inaccessible for people who have a different way of interacting socially, right? Waterloo actually I want to give credit where it's due. One thing that's really interesting is a lot of the new student design, the design for student spaces at Waterloo creates both public and private study space. Because we have a dean in arts who actually really gets it, that students have different social needs in terms of social interaction. Because we had this student space, and what happened was a lot of students were just studying in abandoned classrooms because they didn't want to study in a, like, they didn't want seating that was 15 people around, right? They didn't want, and part of it is the culture that you don't do that, right? But there, there, there's something to be said for having a variety, thinking of space in terms of the ways that different people might have different needs in terms of sensory, you know, things and in terms of interaction. So sometimes they get those things right. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Gomez. Um, I'm going to do some thank yous, and we are presenting you with a gift. So thank you so much for coming out and sharing your brilliance with us and interacting with us and, and all sorts of different ways of learning um, uh, between us. I also want to thank our remote captioner and uh, IT services who managed to pull this off, which feels uh, great, especially uh, Chef Kat Tani for all her help, Margaret Bolton who helped, uh, a special project coordinator um, and also put up with a lot of emails between us all. And uh, Maggie Shi, a research assistant with the Law, Disability and Social Change Project, want to thank the Disability Studies Student Association for their help and especially to Danielle the Duke for volunteering her time today. And thanks to Windsor Law and the Disability Studies Program, School of Social Work, for helping make this event. So thank you very much for coming. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, if people have questions, let me know. Um, There's can, lots of food left, too. Yeah. Please take food. Sure